So it's Simon Brown here. This evening we're looking at the Momentum Portfolio Update. We're looking at the 2016 seven uh, returns and then we're looking at uh, the uh, profits and, and, and uh, so the new stocks for 2017-18. So updating the old one and then look to the new stocks for, for the year coming up uh, in advance. I'm going to have to grab my daughter. It only comes live at 8 o'clock. I'll get that in a couple of minutes as soon as uh, we start to see give it a few minutes to land, then we'll pull in the data and we will search through and pick up those stocks for the, the next year in the Momentum portfolio. Quick bit of the, the theory behind it, uh, investment strategy that really looks to say that trends continue um, and, and that typically trends continue longer than we ever think. And, and, and two examples of that would be NASPAS and Capitech, uh, which have both had a, a stellar 10 years. We could probably throw PSG and many others into it, EOH, et cetera. But our brain struggles with that concept that, that trends continue. And what we often find is that we exit trends far too early. And Momentum says, nope, give them time. Uh, based on research out of London School of Business, uh, uh, Dimson Marsh and uh, starting from 1900 to 2009, they looked using the FTSE 100 stocks. They did longs and shorts. They rebalanced monthly. Their returns certainly beat the FTSE. Uh, big issue was they didn't have costs. And with their rebalancing monthly, that certainly pushed costs up. So the costs would take some shine off that 15.3% per annum. Um, how much? Uh, I mean, certainly a couple of percent, maybe. I mean, let's be onerous and say half, and we end up at 7.6, uh, 7.7% uh, versus a market of 4.2x divs at a percent there. The theory works, uh, and it it it... it it aims to buy the stocks that are moving on a purely basis that the stock is moving, not on any concern around the fundamentals or anything like that. It just says if a stock is moving, you want to own it. I'm going to come back to Dimson and these, uh, Dimson and these folks a little bit later, uh, but for now we can park them there. Uh, practically, we simply sort stocks by the last 12 months. We get a total return. We buy, we buy the winners. It's just that's what momentum is. There's nothing more fancy to momentum than buy those stocks for the last 12 months uh, that get the best returning stocks over the previous 12 months. The issue is the duration that you want to do it. Do you do it one month as, as the uh, London School of Economics people did? Do you do three months as the ABSA ETF used to? 12 months as we do uh, and 12 months that the ABSA ETF now does. And I, my view is it's, it's 12 months. Uh, we'll come back to that in a bit. By the winners, hold for a year. We run a tax year, so one March to end of Feb. Hence, uh, last hour of today, I was selling all of the shares that sat in my momentum portfolio. Um, and if one's trading it, one would enter tomorrow being 1st of March. We don't gear. Absolutely no gearing. We don't gear this portfolio. There's a lot of talk. I mean, this year, cut out the bag, we have a negative return. You gear your negative returns. Yeah, I know, you gear your positive returns as well. But if you have a 2008 type scenario year, um, those negative returns are going to significantly hurt in a geared portfolio. And I funded it with 200,000 over uh, three years in Jan 13, March 14, and March 15, in total putting in 200,000. All the returns are based on a unitized portfolio. So by the time we put 40,000 in and then 60,000, we got less units because the value of the units had gone up. Our bank for buck therefore had decreased. Changed methodology uh, last year. For, um, in previous years, we've done a top 40 and a mid-cap portfolio. If I go even further back, I had done a top 40 portfolio. I've been running this in one way or another now since 19, uh, sorry, 2007 was my first year of having done it, um, which was just top 40, introduced mid-cap as well in more recent years, um, but now blended the two together. So rather than two separate portfolios, one blended portfolio, uh, top 100 as a benchmark, and use that as the pool of stocks. In other words, rather than looking at two separate portfolios, one at the top 40 and one at the mid cap, blend the two together. And the logic here, so back when I first started this and I just did the top 40, out of the 40 stocks, I bought the top five. Um, and that's great, but it adds serious concentration risk. Now, we can argue points around it and, 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 and the like in, in, in Q&A, but in essence, we said, let's try and mitigate some of that, that risk. And the first year we did it, it worked spectacularly poorly, but we'll come to those numbers as well. We aim to be the benchmark annually and over three-year rolling. Uh, we will slip occasionally for annually, but we must never slip on a three-year rolling. We must always beat a benchmark on a three-year rolling. 
And quite frankly, we buy the top 15 out of those 100 stocks. We buy the five must be from top 40, five must be mid cap, and then the next best five. Although it's be forcing at least a third into the top 40, a third into the mid cap, and then the next best, whichever index they're potentially going to come from. So key points, merge those two portfolios, uh, looking for a three-year rolling beating of the benchmark uh, annual as well, 15 stocks, five from top 40, five from mid cap, and then the next five from that same pool of 100. Returns up to last year, I'm coming to this year's returns in a moment. Um, we'd had fairly solid returns. We'd beaten the market with an exception here. We had beaten the market. Uh, a minus 5.1 is not fun. Benchmark minus 6.6. .6. Technically, you take that as a winner, you were less behind. Short version was working. Mid cap giving better results. It will in the good years. Uh, in poor years, obviously, it will struggle. And in fact, in poor years, it could get fairly taken to the cleaners if you're in the wrong space. So there's my 2016-17 returns. This is a screenshot from the live portfolio, uh, 5 to 4 this afternoon. Short version, we're down. I'll come to the exact numbers in a moment. We're down 5.6%, but then we pick up some of the cash that sits there, which is dividends and no paid letters. Um, the key distinction this year from previous years, if we look at uh, uh, total movement, and we've got some killers, Anglo Gold, Brait, Goldfields, and Sabania. We've got some decent winners, Sapi, uh, Resilient, uh, PSG, uh, Coop up 51 uh, and up the rest, all the negatives. So we've got some winners, but we've got some killer, killer losers. Now, one of the key points is we don't action stop loss on this. And I'm going to talk about it in a bit more detail also coming up, but we don't action stop loss on it because the numbers didn't work. The numbers don't work. Stop loss doesn't help. What it will do is you put a stop loss at whatever point. A stock goes down by that percentage. Let's say a stock, you put your stop loss at 20%. The stock is down 20%. Uh, and then starts to recover. Now, when I've back tested it, more often than not, a stock that was down by your stop loss would recover rather than lose some more. And it just, the math didn't come through in the process. You're ungeared, you're selling in a year, you, you've got a, a stop loss in a sense of time. I've always had the caveat that if there was some major uh, uh, corporate issue, I could I could pull my, my golden card in a sense and exit a stock, but otherwise they stay for the period. Um, those stocks have all been sold, uh, and this afternoon they were all exited. We ended up with 200 and just under 245,000 rand. Uh, there is still some interest that will be due for February, but it will be 30 or 50 rand. So portfolio was down 5.2% after all costs. Uh, top 40 up 0 0.7, mid cap up 14.2. If we blend those in half, we get a 7.5% return for the benchmark versus a minus 5.2% for the momentum portfolio, which frankly is a whipping. Uh, 12 points behind is, is, is a really, really, really bad return. It is going to happen. So typically, my expectation and my usage of the portfolio, and if I go back to that screen quick, is I lose, the, you have a losing year every one out of three or four years. Um, what caught us last year was the sudden rotation into resources, and we just happened to straddle that, and we bought them, and the, then the gold miners all went off the boil. That is going to happen. That is a, f a factor of it. I'm not unhappy, unhappy with, no, I, and I am unhappy. I, I accept the reality that sometimes we have negative years. Uh, question, who do I'm using? Uh, I use Ami Broker. I have set up my um, watch list for top 40 and mid cap, and then I use investordata.cozov uh, to supply my data, Mike down in Cape Town. So as I said, losing your, nothing fun about that. And it's less, the, the being negative doesn't bother me. What bothers me is being below the benchmarks. If we look back here, we were negative, but we beat it. Now, I know it's small solace, but the point is you want to be ahead of the market. Um, I want to beat it every three-year rolling. I want to beat it uh, most years, and I'm happy if it's only two out of three or three out of four. Um, and th then you get those overall returns. It's like a trader. You don't win every trade. It's just on balance of probability. This time, we didn't win the trade. End of story. Um, so, Quick touch on stop loss. So this year, a stop loss would have been great. Let's go back to these numbers here. Uh, there's certainly a couple of stocks where a stop loss would have significantly helped. We are my percentages, minus 30, minus 52, minus 44, 
uh, minus 54, minus 17. The minus 17 is fine. There are a couple of biggies here. Even the minus 30 doesn't overly stress me. So I did the crunching, and I say, which what level of stop loss improves my returns? And that's simple, right? You say if you're below zero, sell it. The second it goes below zero, but then a lot of the stocks you've you've got, you would still have exited. Understand what a stop loss is. Um, and I didn't grab that chart, but let's randomly take one of these stocks that is modestly up. Uh, that one that's up 3.2, Mondi. Um, at some point this year, Mondi would have been negative. Right, so Monday is down. Uh, we exited at our stop loss, and we don't get that recovery. So let's say at some point Monday had been down five percent. We exit. Um, we don't get that eight point two percent uplift. So the problem with your stop loss is it also then removes some of your positive trades during the course of the year. The point of momentum, as it always comes back to, is that momentum takes some courage in the sense that you've got to say this thing is perhaps expensive and has been moving for a while. But the point being is. Even on retraces, more times than not, it will continue. Stocks, indices, whatever they are, turn infrequently. Typically, they go higher or they go lower, and they will follow those trends for periods of time. Kumbu went down for, went up for years and then went down for years and years and years. So there's a risk with stop losses. And even if we take a negative number of minus 16 on NEPI, at one point it was down minus 22. So if we had stopped at minus 20, we wouldn't have got the 4% uplift. Let's not kid ourselves. If we said minus 20 was our stop loss, we wouldn't have minus 52 on break, 100%. I run the numbers for this year, but I've also got to run it for the previous years as well. Where we, this is the first time I've had stocks down 50%. Never seen it before. Um, if you run it for previous years, the only level that worked, if you take a stop loss at 40% down, you say when a stock hits 40% down, 40%, you bail it immediately the day it closes, 40% down. I'm using end of day data. At that point, you improve the returns of this year and you do not change the returns of previous years. The issue then, of course, is are we retrofitting? And that's a call you have to make. I will continue to run without stop loss. So let's go and grab those stocks for this year. Uh, we should have that. That should have crunched. And for some reason, it goes back and has a quick look at August 2015. I have no idea why. Uh, and there's my top 40. We're going to do a quick review. So what we're simply going to do now is we're going to say up to the close of 28 Feb 2017, we're going to do yearly returns. We're going to filter on top 40 initially. And let's have a look-see. And those are the returns, top of the list being Anglo. Uh, question coming through. Yeah, so so is asking. So every, I don't I don't withdraw the money. What I do every year is I sell the stocks. So this afternoon I sold the stocks I bought on first of March 2016, and tomorrow we go and buy the stocks that are for the 2017-18 selection. So there are my stocks. I want to do two things. I want to grab a quick screenshot so that I've got them there, and I also want to mark them down. So it is AGO, TBS, IMP, BVT, and BIL. So those are the five stocks that definitely go in. Um, the ones that come after that are NED at 31.7, uh, Standard, at 30.1 and sappy at 29.3 i want to check something here um i've got bulletin at 31.4 i've got netbank at 31.7 i want to see the dividend yield because if netbank's got a better dividend yield then netbank is into the party and let's show those no surprises. Kumba at the top. Uh, KIO, uh, Essel, Barlow, Northern, and Cap. Blast. Cap wasn't there and I sold it. Uh, followed up very shortly by Exaro at 54. 
Omnia at 43.9 and PSG at 43.7. Uh, and then Blue Label BLU at 42.4. And then we've got a whole bunch. And Platts pops up twice. It is in, 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 in the, the um, top 40, but according to my broker, it's also in the, in the mid cap, which is not true, but nonetheless, it's what they're telling me in. Uh, as I thought, Nedbank is 3.96, let's call it 4%. I think it's going to be much more than Billiton. Yeah, the dividend yield is 0.8%. What that effectively means is that Ned goes into our top 40 uh, selection of 5 and Billiton drops out because dividend yield total return gives Nedbank the better deal. I'm not in counting, including today's dividend. Um, that's not important. The results are out today for Nedbank. It hasn't yet been paid. So in that sense, it's not, it's not relevant whatsoever. Um, I want to grab a screenshot of that. We need to pick our next five as well, which are going to be Xora, Omnia, PSG, and Blue Label. Uh, let me go and update here. Is that my code for a saw? Oh, I can never remember a saw of all the billions of codes. NHM is Northern and KAP, Blue Label, and one more from the mid cap list. HCI popped up. I want to see what Imperial's dividend yield is. It might get ahead of HCI. Uh, Imperial 3.6, HCI 1.2. So 1.2 goes to 43, but 3.6. So actually, Imperial goes in as number five. So those are the 15 stocks. Um, question being, when do we buy them? Tomorrow morning. Um, we boogie off and, 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 and simply buy the stocks. Here's the question. I'm not entering next year's, this next year's portfolio. I'm going to touch on that in a second. Um, but those are the 15 stocks for the, the uh, Momentum portfolio for 2017-2018. Yeah, question coming through. Is it not always going to bias towards the next five? In other words, those down there, are they not always going to be biased to bias? It's a great question. Um, are they not always going to be biased towards uh, mid-cap? And the short answer is yes. For movers 6 to 10 on mid-cap to, to, to be number 6 in top 40, is, is it can happen. Never say never, but it's an unlikely event. Um, and certainly, I don't expect to see it often. I think last year, I think one of the, the last five were coming through. The rest all were a case of coming again from the mid-cap process. So buying the stocks is tomorrow. So here's the point. And I mentioned this in an update of uh, September of last year and again in an update of January of this year um, that for myself, I'm pausing the, the, the momentum portfolio. Two reasons. We'll continue to track it because I know that there are people who are tracking it. And we have we've got negotiations to turn it into a a uh, investable instrument so you can invest into it and, and, and have it automatically do it etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but for me I'm not and simply it's just it's too many stocks for me so I only own 10 shares and then three others I own 13 shares I'm very and I've always owned very few individual shares back in the day this portfolio used to have five so it pushed my holding up to around 18 and of my total holding I might have uh, 20 stocks, 18 stocks, of which five would have been momentum. This year, I'm sitting on 28 stocks in total, of which 15 are momentum and 13 are not. And it's just, it's not how I structure my portfolios. I do some indices, and I'm very much more selective on my personal stocks that I invest in. So I'm switching the cash into the ABSA momentum, and then I'm going to switch some of the cash into my lazy system that I've got going. I've got uh, 200K in my lazy system. I'm continuing to train to trade the lazy system, and I'm going to beef that up. I'm going to park half of this money into the momentum one and half the money into, into uh, the lazy system. Big thing about it as well is that the momentum, Epson Momentum ETF changed their methodology in September of last year. They used to use the same methodology as myself, but they did a three-month look-back period. 
And I always had the argument, and I remember, I remember up front, I said the, the, the guys who did it at London School of Economics, they did a 12-month look-back period, and they did a one-month rebalance. EBSA was doing a three-month look-back and a three-month rebalance. And I, I didn't agree with the, the three-month look-back. The rebalance, yes, if you can get your costs low enough, which an insto like EBSA can do, a three-month rebalance can work. Um, but I really didn't like the idea of the look-back. It was too short a period to look back over. In September, they changed their look back to 12 months. So now they're doing, and I want to say they're doing what I always suggested, but in truth, what they're doing is they're now saying that they're doing the same methodology that, that broadly we are. And then the question is, the only difference now is, so they put a liquidity filter um, and they rebalance more frequently. The question is, why don't we then go into the ETF? And the short answer is, apart from my not wanting all these shares, and it's linked into I'm selling everything and I'm trying to just declutter my life. And 28 shares felt like so much clutter. And some of you out there are laughing. And that's cool. You know, that's fine. But if we can go into an ETF, here's the one benefit. What the ETF is going to do for us is save us on the tax. Now, this year, in fact, we get a tax claim back. That's nice. But in previous years, with those returns, you've got to take tax off because you are trading this account. So, yes, you can take costs, and this, lo this loss this year will be a cost. I will offset it against next year's profits. But what you still do is you get onerized by tax. And it's a key thing as an individual. If we're trading as an individual, the tax hurts. Dividend tax is now 20%. And then, of course, income tax at 41, and you get nailed on all of that. If you are trading as a collective investment scheme, a unit trust, a hedge fund, or an exchange-traded fund, you don't pay tax. They don't pay tax internally. We pay tax on our profits when we sell and on our dividends. The costs come out of dividends, so that's reduced. And the profits, if you hold for three years, are capital gains. So here's the deal. Why, if they're going to do the same methodology, do we try and reinvent the wheel? And my answer, and, and you might come with a different answer. My answer was, why? A good point. Why? I still like uh, momentum as a concept. I still subscribe to the methodology of momentum. Uh, absolutely, I do. But I can do it clean, easy, and more tax efficient in NFE MOM. And Benefit, I have less stocks, therefore less clutter. I talk about that in episode 246 of JC Direct. If you can go find it there and you'll get the, the go on the right navigation bar, uh, right hand side navigation bar, scroll down and you will find the, the details. Um, so that's my take. If you want to trade it, you're more than welcome. As always, read the disclaimers, which is profit to yours, as are losses. Um, and those are the 15 shares for this particular year. So review is that trends continue. Momentum is a real thing. We see trends. We see it in stock markets. Let's take our current trend, which is not a trend. We've gone sideways for three years. But in truth, that is a trend. Again, it's almost three years that our market has been going sideways. If we go to, let me call up lazy. Let me call up top 40. Let me shut that. Uh, there is our glorious top 40. Um, someone's asking, uh, yeah, I'm running parallels in Mac because I run a Mac system. So I then run parallels uh, in order to be able to run Mac. Let's go to my weekly chart. I mean, there's our market. So we got to around these levels in 2014. Um, there, so we got to our current level now. We first reached back in April of 2014. Almost exactly three years you've been going sideways. A, tightly, a slightly tightening formation, but the point is three years of sideways. That is no fun whatsoever. So trends, be they sideways, up or down, tend to continue for longer. Methodology of momentum says find those winners over the previous 12 months within your benchmark, which is top 100 in this example. Uh, hold them for a year. Buy them. Hold them for a year. If you want, sell them at 40% down or put some stop loss level in. As I said, we merged those top 40 and mid caps into a top 100. We buy the 15 stocks and it works. Momentum works. Tax and costs. Uh, and cost is one of the reasons why we rebalance annually, although a more frequent rebalance post costs. So I, I ran the numbers to rebalance on a quarterly basis. We got uh, slightly same returns. 
um, simply because of, of the costs involved in the, in the equation. You know, when I'm transacting, I'm paying 0.96 to buy, 0.61 to sell. In fact, I think 0.95 to buy and 0 .6, 0 0.7 rather to sell. Um, that's 165 point round trip. That's expensive. Yeah, it's a cost. It's a drag. If you're doing it in the portfolio, you do that four times, that's 6% to your annual return. Um, hence, NFE MON for me. Uh, folks, questions, drop me questions. Uh, I've got my stuff done here for the evening. But if you've got questions, we'll certainly take some of those. First question coming through is, does NFMOM fit within a tax-free account? Uh, and I'm going to double check that. But yes, it does. Um, which means you can put it into your tax free if you want to, and hence save even more. There it is. There. Uh, question asking the returns for NOFME. So short answer is our system has beaten it. Although this last year they beat us. Um, the logic is quite simple. They were using, to my mind, the wrong methodology. A market that's gone sideways for three years and they've done 17.7 percent is not the worst in the world, but really that's no. Thanks, but no. You can see they got caught by gold. Getting into the gold stocks really worked and then getting hurt by gold. Does it have five years history? It does 86% over five years. Yeah, yeah, I can take that. That's a decent return. Yeah, so two questions coming through. Am I still trading my lazy? Yes. Am I still keeping my other shares? Yes. Uh, quick disclaimer. Let's go there. My portfolio is published there. Uh, go to simonbrown.coza slash portfolio, um, and my entire portfolio sits there. I continue to trade the lazy system, absolutely, um, and I continue to hold my shares. I've got my 10 death to us part stocks, um, and I have my current three second tiers. I'm pondering my second tiers. I might bail those as well and go and buy a unit trust. Um, it's just I do enjoy the second tiers, and I've only got three there at the moment. So in my ideal world, I want that universe to be about 15 stocks. At the moment, it's 13. Um, I'm looking at, at at one or two for for up for the death to us part. Uh, the question is going to be which one or two. I'm looking at Bidcorp. I'm looking at Mondi, um, and I'm looking at some second tiers. Nothing really thrilling me in the second tier right now. I'm going to have a close look at Sea Harvest when it IPOs. I'm going to probably pick up some Sea Harvest. A uh, question coming through from uh, how does one buy the ETFs for my TFSA is the banks and brokers are saying we're only able to buy certain ETFs via TFSA. So you can only buy certain ETFs, but that list of ETFs is fairly giant. Um, it is about 40-odd uh, ETFs. What some of the banks are doing is they're restricting you to what you can buy. So FMB only lets you buy the uh, RMB top 40 and the uh, mid cap uh, the mid cap ETF, um, but that's their own restriction. If you go to if you go to uh, uh, I, I use ABSA for my tax free account. If you go to the other folks for that, they will let you buy any of the stocks. And now my website is loading up an absolute uh, pain. Uh, sea Harvest, yes, IPO at the end of March. Uh, we'll see pricing. We'll also get a hint from the um, Premier Fishing IPOs to how it will do. Um, I expect both to do fairly well and be oversubscribed. So I'm hoping my website is not down, but it is certainly loading very, very slowly. Folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, so we will park it there. Yeah, so a question coming on NFE MOM. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 so the plan is to buy it tomorrow morning, as I would normally have done the stocks at 9 o'clock. Uh, no, actually, it's an ETF. I'll wait. In fact, I've got meetings all morning, so I'll probably buy it in the afternoon. Uh, plan is to to buy it and add it to my portfolio and then hold it as a, as a, as a holding within my ETF portfolio. Um, if you see that there, and it's still not loading through. If you go to uh, the home of – if you go to just one lap, uh, look under uh, recent, you'll see ETFs, you'll see the link to all of the available ETFs within a tax-free account. Um, it will then just form part of my ETF holding. Okay, just sending that through. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there for this evening. Uh, video will be up later this evening. We'll tweet the screenshots if you didn't get them and you're wondering what's what. 
Um, oh, will I be trading the, the Momentum ETF? Nope, I will just be holding it. As I said, it will be a core holding. It will just sit there in my uh, ETF portfolio. Uh, yeah, I'll hold it. I'll, I like, uh, uh, yeah. Great. Sorry, another question coming through on Satrix 40. I hold it there, set up, but I prefer the core shares equal weight. Why do I have both? Um, I have Satrix 40 for legacy reasons. I am bleeding it out. What I mean by that is every year you get 40,000 CGT, uh, first 40,000 CGTs tax free. So every year I sell, again, I did it today, I sell some Satrix 40s to take up my total uh, CGT allowance for the year to 40,000. At some point, I will sell it down to zero, but I'm not I'm not in a massive rush. I, I certainly prefer the core shares equal weight. I certainly have more of those than I do of Satrix, and over the next couple of years, they will switch across. Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening. Uh, we will chat again. Cheers, all.